this is a webinar focused on grid flexibility. Uh, my name is Roel Mossink, and I am the project manager of the IRIS project. Uh, and I will guide you uh, through this webinar. And this, this webinar will give insights in the energy transition and the shift towards renewable energy sources. Um, in particular, we will focus on the decentralization of renewable electricity gen generation. The step from centralized power plants to a decentralized system with a lot of individual locations where power is generated gives challenges at all levels of the electricity grid. We will discuss in this webinar how these challenges are handled at a global and a local level. You will be taken into the global energy trade markets and what is needed to provide a stable electricity market without disruptions. Since IRIS is focused on energy and mobility solutions at the local scale, this webinar also provides examples of pilot projects at local level and how the flexibility market works and how that brings new types of stakeholders into play. We can show you now, oh, we, we will show you now the program of this webinar. Exactly. As you can see, we will start with a presentation by Christian Kain of EDF uh, in France. Uh, Christian will take us on a time journey explaining how the global energy market is shifting and what that means for the global and local energy market. After that, John Hodemarkers of Steden will take over and show what challenges a DSO faces in a decentralized energy market. And finally, Christian closes with a five minute pitch uh, and some take home messages for you. I want to introduce now Christian Kang. He works for EDF, uh, Electricity of France. Uh, Christian originally comes from Italy, but graduated in Germany at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and where he also started his career at the European Institute for Energy Research. Uh, after a five-year mission in China uh, for the opening of the new EDF R&D Center and the development of smart city activity for EDF, he moved to France. Now he is a project manager uh, for EDF in charge of realizing innovative offers for public calls for tenders and eco districts. And it's usually based on the coordination of multiple business units in the domain of district and decentralized energy systems. Uh, at the same time, uh, he coordinates different EU projects for EDF in South France. Uh, one of them is the IRIS project. And um, so I will now uh, shift to the presentation of uh, Christian. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, just remember, we'll tell you next, then a lot of times. So, well, I want to give you a broad overview about the energy market. So, uh, this is where we come from. I think the picture is clear. We come from a system uh, based mainly based on um, fossil fuel generation. And next, please, you will see that. Uh, that is what we're actually heading to. So a uh, picture about an Europa. We know that our renewables at the big scale, they are dislocated both spatially and temporally across the whole country. So next, please. So make this picture really happening. What Europe knows is that we really have to have an integrated market and an energy union. So uh, transfer of energy, which goes across the borders and which enables every each and everybody at any corner of the Europe be able to leverage from renewables that might be at the other end of Europe. So next, please. Um, next. So in the past, uh, what do I give you as a take uh, in the, about the past? It's just to show a little bit the timeline of how things can happen, how we get there today. So next, please. You will see that we have three and the first keyword is actually unbanding. Unbanding means to uh, put transport and distribution of electricity to uh, displace them and have in the between from production to retail just a wholesale market. It actually was the keyword of the second electricity directive, so about almost 10 years later. But what I want to understand is that this whole changes, it took about 20 years until we got out about 2014, I really had all TSO, which would be certified, ways compliant with some bonding. So just to make you understand that 
things are not happening as fast as people would like or would like to expect or the European Commission would like to expect. And what has been taken away from the third energy package is actually to make things happen, people have to put together the same table and have to be discussed and maybe found their own way to go and further. That's why we have the Acer community has been created and the NSOA uh, platforms. Next, please. We actually, the, the, the directives, they're all going towards from our regular let's say a hybrid market. So I say hybrid, hybrid because as you have seen popping up a lot of directives that coming out and which actually setting new trends uh, that don't go down into national regulation, regular actions and regular national ways of treating the issue like integrating more renewables which actually distort in the market and the energy industry they have to react somehow. So next please. So you will see that this typically creates energy business. So that really period diversification but then we had to readdress the things were not moving as fast as expected so we have a reconsolidation then we have the new directives all about the renewables so the sector shifted towards investing massively into renewables realized big projects and complex projects mostly for given the possibilities renewables to play uh, into the system. And then, well, we had science 2009, a really stagnating sector, uh, where we have a stagnated demand with an overcapacity from uh, combined cycle gas turbines, which is pretty huge. Uh, we had Fukushima also making a big issue in the system. So we are in a phase where still the energy sector has not recovered totally yet. So next. So today we have two main ways to trade the electricity. So we have what we call the over-the-counter market, which is like a continuous market. It's a bilateral contract between a buyer and a seller. And actually it's totally anonymous to the rest of the players as it's just, uh, let's say, uh, easily a secret between the two. So but today it represents really about still about 80% of the volume of the whole energy traded. And then you have the power exchanges. Uh, next, please. Which actually, if you make it... Uh, Platform like in, you might imagine Wall Street, where you have bidders, buyers, and sellers, uh, where everything is in real time, transparent, uh, all the parties are anonymous. And today, there are a couple of them in Europe. So, next, please. So, what we have today, the, uh, to, uh, we have, if you look into the energy market, what we call the market share platforms, you have two main big blocks the forward market. A long term, six months, 12 months, 24 months, your energy, your hedging against variability in the market, it's actually stabilizing your long term. And then you have what we call the spot market, so day ahead and intraday markets. This is really where you optimize your energy supply balance and you uh, readjust everything as fast as possible until real time uh, and correct, let's say, all errors in your forecast. And as you see, there are price caps inside because here's where the market becomes peak. And you can have uh, virtually uh, all prices for uh, your energy. And government said how much is too much. So different national governments have put different price caps, as you can see in the trading market. You might find plus minus 2,000 euros. In other ones, they said 3,000 euros is enough. So next, please. So once the market finishes at one hour before real time. That's what we say, gates closed. And then everything goes into the hands of the TSO, which ensures that the system works well, that the grid is stable, we have no blackouts, no crash downs. And that can be almost said as a market, but it's handled differently in all uh, different nations. So next, please. So where's the flexibility there inside? It's not really a forward market, forward product, it's mostly a spot market product. So in day ahead and intraday, where you can find both uh, products and services coming from a B2B or B2C services. Whereas if we're moving to the transmission side, so uh, on the reserve side, we mostly find B2B uh, offers and there's also we find the best value. So more we go from the left down to the right, so more we are moving towards real time. We the value increases, so it's where you get most capital out of it. But activation duration, the frequency really lower. At the same time, the automation and the reliability constraint are rising. So it has to be really sure to have these product or services done and given in short term. But at the same time, for that you have to invest more. You have to provide out automation system. It has to be more reliable. Everything gets more expensive. So next, please. And who are the actors there inside, I mean, today, 
after the left side is what you had before the energy directive on the right side what i would say uh, making an easy picture what is there today you know talking about production much more you talk about traders and pro uh, brokers they're hedging or speculating on a portfolio of uh, assets or just a portfolio of pro products next please uh transport is not just a transport so you transport the energy across the country or between countries i mean it's actually the and the European Union is pushing that it also becomes a market. And that we have TSO, which can trade different products among different countries. And that is all on the balance and adjustment markets. Next, please. Retail is not what it was before anymore. You have pure retailers, so people that are selling energy source from the wholesale market, which have no any asset, which have no fixed pricing, so they can sell energy for less than the other ones. Or you have consumer associations, they can just group together and source you the energy directly on the wholesale market. Next, please. And then you have what we call the services, where actually I would put the demand response. Demand response means consuming less, generating more at your house product on the market. Exactly, you need many of them. We have to unify them in portfolio, which is given to an aggregator, and this aggregator can retransform them into viable products to be sold on the transport and wholesale market up, uh, in the upper level so that we ensure that we have the needed volumes and capacity to be able to let's say uh, compete with a power plant next please and what is not totally considered yet today is actually that we could do the same for a dso level so for the distribution level so aggregator could sell some products and services to a distribution this actually what I would say, it's a next design, uh, market design challenge in Europe. So next, please. About um, integration of the markets. So you see here a picture in green, you see that actually we have price coupling, the price coupling of the regions. So we have one single algorithm which ensure that we have the coupling among all exchange platforms, which actually represents 23 countries and about 2 million euros of uh, match trades every day which i said before is not the big part of the of the key we're talking about just 10 to 20 percent of uh, the overall transaction next please when we go into market now if you go into intraday market the things are not there yet so we have a first platform that had been launched this year we have about 40 connected countries it has been sized to uh, host about 400 trades per day and you will see yet national regulation, uh, national regulators still put a burden to be able to have intraday, so hourly type of transaction across the borders. Next, please. Christian, so we have moved. Christian, yes? you have you have five more minutes. Yes, perfect. Then, if we go into the right side of the scheme where we had the TSO market, I just to let you understand prior rapidly what it is so next please if you have a power plant is crying right it's not it's going out of connection whatever you have a lowering of your frequency you have a loss of power it will impact the frequency of the network and that's what you have to ensure next please is that you have something a power loss has to be uh, has to be to do, to be counterbalanced in the set range of seconds so in 15 seconds it should be ensured to stabilize the frequency the power loss the secondary reserve will have to stabilize the uh, frequency in about 15 minutes and then you have what we call the tertiary reserves we actually substitute your lost uh, asset or assets in plural so before this was just done by generation means today we can do it with uh, demand side management and flexibility i would like to call it so next please And next, super. So just here to give you an idea, what is the big issue in the future that we have? It's not an issue, it's good that we have a lot of renewables that we spread differently among the countries. But next, please, what will happen is that we have to ensure that this capacity is be able to be traded across the countries. So if you see in the blue bar is actually, if the things stay as they are today, we have a lot of renewables, we have to be just shut off and cannot be traded and given to another one because just interconnection capacity doesn't enable that however if we make the system connecting capacity they have we will have the small pink bar on the right and i will see that actually it's handable we can manage all the renewables in a range of 2030 we'll be able to manage at the european level next 
and also do two to three times next, please. So what you have is that when you put such variable renewable generation to the system, what happens that we have, next please, you have to move from a load curve as we have today, we go to a residual load curve. So residual means whatever is a generation you can control, they will do everything after renewables. Renewables kick in, they take part of the load, and then you have to do the rest with whatever you can control. But this has two main drawbacks. First one is you have to increase your backup capacity, so the peak part, but at the same time, it just reduces massively also the base load. So if you make next, please, what the part, it wasn't conceived for that. And we have a problem about cash flow into the system to be able to renew it and adapt it and change it. Really a big issue. So next, please. So what you have to take away from here is that if you look at the green part, we're talking about uh, 10 square kilometers. You have massive renewables that come in. Uh, they create a lot of spikes, but as far as you move up to national, down to the Europe level, the whole thing I build can be can be smoothed out. So coincidence of uh, spatially and temporally is smoothing out. So this thing message is we can handle that on European level. But next, please. But what will happen is that already today, 90% of the renewables are distribution level side. So the problem is how, when they're reaching the tipping point in the future, when there will be really a massive kid integration, how do we deal them locally? So next, please. And next. So I just to leave you with this one. So um, really what's happening with the, the challenging about the renewable energy source, from the transport to distribution level. You have seen in transport level market design is advancing. Distribution side, it's not advancing the same path. And the second point is that the system has to be has to be managed uh, with means that today are not such available or not integrated into the system at the volume they should. So what is the thesis that actually prosumers, so uh, demand side management, storage, multi energy system have to be in to get into the market to be able to fill this gap. So, next, please. And this is what also the European Commission says. So, they really want that we have a market which enables to uh, have shorter term trading. I put you the figure about this price and the spot market. So, it's there we really have the possibility in the short term to have higher prices, get capital back into the system and be able to ensure different means we have in the system. Uh, next, please. And the other point that's also setting for the European Commission is actually that we should really foster also the heating sector. So we have to, up to date, the heating sector is like of moving in parallel or no position sometimes to electric, electrical system. What they're saying is actually should be integrated and move forward together in an integrated way because we had a lot of uh, potential behind power to heat or power to x power to gas technologies which could be used uh, to create services for the electricity system and the third one uh, last one sorry so next please is that the commission asked for is to define make it possible for all the consumers all type of them to be able to generate store share consume and we sell the energies on the energy markets. So, thanks a lot. That was for me. I guess I will, will take the time to directly then introduce uh, John Hodemakers, and uh, John will um, uh, open the presentation. Uh, well, I'll be saying something about John's background, because he's an electrical, electric technical engineer, and has experience in asset management. And now John is the innovation manager at Stadin, which is a Dutch DSO, uh, where he's responsible for a portfolio of smart grid related projects. Uh, the focus of these projects is the transition uh, to a more sustainable energy system. And one of these projects is Iris. Furthermore, John is uh, chairman of the executive board of the Youssef Foundation. Uh, Stadin is one of the founding partners. And USEF stands for uh, Universal Smart Energy Framework, which is a market control mechanism for unleashing flexibility into a future sustainable energy system. Uh, this mechanism will also be applied in the Utrecht demonstration area. Um, I will now uh, give uh, John uh, the floor and uh, yeah, give him some time for his presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.
you all for this uh, introduction and uh, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to, to give you a presentation on flexibility. The subtitle is an antidote to relieve pain in the changing energy system. But why pain and why do we need an antidote? Well, as you might understand also by the presentation of Christian, uh, the challenges are big, as also said by the European Union. Miguel Arias Kenyete uh, uh, also stated that in 2050, uh, the, 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 the energy market, the electricity market will be carbon free. And he also includes that it should be market oriented, flexi oriented flexibility in the grid. So that's very important if we want to meet the Paris climate commitments that we made. So these changes will be very huge. So possibly the, uh, the existing rules, rules, and technical system will not cope with all these changes. So there will be pain in the system. And we already see some trends coming. We see increase in the renewable electricity production from fossil to renewable. Electricity is to become the largest energy carrier at the point of final consumption. And that's due to the larger scale electrification of energy demands. It will be a significant effort to do all the grid enforcements that are needed. And there will be resource problems basically money, but most of all, I think, workforce to do all the work. And the introduction of alternative flex options, storage, demand response, flexible grid tariffs will give the possibility to really put extra flexibility into the grid and into the system. And moreover, we've seen an increase in the realization of interconnection and the coupling of electricity markets. The electricity market, the energy market is changing from, as we knew it, a supply chain and a physical infrastructure, a supply chain with contracts, a physical infrastructure with real assets, uh, into a system that's an integrated market. A system in which energy service companies will be introduced managing your energy, aggregators that will uh, buy and sell flexibility, and the consumer will become a prosumer, having active demands and supply. They are going to produce their energy for example, by solar panels, and they have smart appliances like smart charging, storage, and uh, intellect of, uh, smart uh, appliances like washing machine and dishwashers. And this all means that the distribution network operator becomes a system operator also to manage it in the local grid. My perspective to flexibility is from state in a district system operator delivering gas and electricity in the wide areas in the map of the Netherlands on the right. So we maintain, expand and replace gas and electricity networks. And we do the same for electricity and gas connections. We install and manage the energy meters and we deal with all interruptions, disturbances, maintenance and so on. And in this area, you might see, yes, there it is, the IRIS project in Utrecht, where we will do a demonstration area in which we will take, take, take place. Chris Richen already told about this part, so it will be brief. We go from nuclear, coal-fired and gas-fired to another world, a more sustainable world with solar production, wind production, and even here in Utrecht, a picture of a combined solar and wind unit. But it also means that from an old situation where we could uh, produce more when there was more demand and we could produce less when there was less demand, we will now have to deal with much production when there is much solar and wind and less production when there is less solar and wind. So this will lead to new issues in the energy system. And moreover, as already stated by the trends, there will be more and more electrification. We will be driving electric vehicles. We will use electric heat pumps instead of natural gas for heating our houses. And we will use more and more air co climate control because on one hand, people always want more comfort. And on the other hand, remember the hot summer we had this year. And there was a huge uh, amount of people that wanted to, uh, to buy uh, air conditioning units. So there will be a, a huge change in the system. All this will also change from the system on the left to the system on the right. The system on the left, we see in top the power plants, fossil fueled. We see some uh, industries on the medium voltage grid and the low voltage grid where we have houses and small enterprises, medium enterprises. And they're all using energy that is going top down through the system. And this will change in the near future system where there is, as you can see, less fossil production. And there is at all levels, there is production with solar panels and wind uh, mills. As you can see, electricity cars are being charged. So 
what we can see is that the energy is not only going top down but also bottom up and at some levels we even have an exchange within the same level between customers all this changes production and demand will lead to a mismatch in the energy system and one of the mismatches is the imbalance between production and demand at certain moments in time there will be less production than demand so there will be an issue in the grid and so we have to lower the demand to meet it through production other moments in time there might be a lot of solar and wind so we have a lot of production and less demand so what we will see is there's continuously a change in the grid in the balance and to, to match with each other the production and demand but that's not the only issue we also have to bring the energy from its production location to the location where it is used well and that you can compare with the highway the highway where at some moments in time there is enough room for all the cars that want to be on the highway and they can drive smoothly into uh, to their uh, destination but at other moments in time everybody wants to uh, to to, to uh, use the same highway at the same time so we get some congestion that we call traffic jam but it's also so in the electricity grid when everybody wants to charge his car, everybody uh, wants to, uh, to to heat his house or cut solar production and no demand because everybody is going to his work. So we need flexibility to relieve system pain. And here is the start of the flexibility part in the presentation. Flexibility, we can do peak shaving, so lowering the peak and uh, add it to another uh, demand or up the feed in on the grid. We can also try to shift demand to a moment in time where it's more uh, fit into, does more fit into the grid or more fit to the production. And we can also use a combination of both where we shift as well in time as we shift an amount of the, 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 the desired flow in the grid. So flexibility to relieve system pain. But how do we unleash flexibility? To do that, we have to activate the customer. But an individual customer only having a smart appliance or a car to charge of a small battery, it's not enough flexibility to be of value of the four parties at the right side, right side of the slide, the distribution system operator, the balance responsible party, and the transmission system operator. So that's why a new role of an aggregator is introduced, as I said in the beginning, then found new roles needed in the system to aggregate the small amounts of flexibility into a bigger amount of flexibility that is of value for the partners on the right side of the slide. But does it work? Well, we tested it in an energy project we did in Hoogdalem, and that is one of the pre-pilot results. An all, all electricity uh, area, so there is no natural gas for any appliance, and the house has solar panels, heat pumps, a smart control unit, a battery system, smart appliances and a web portal to see what are the effects of their, uh, their handling. And it was a project done by the Youssef Foundation State in uh, ABB, a technology provider, KPN, uh, Telecom Party, Heymans, the builder of the houses and the municipality of Gorkum, where we did the project. What happens? The first is we wanted to increase self-consumption, store self-produced solar energy. And when the sun starts shining, we see that the, the storage is uh, charging because the gray line, the state of charge of the battery is rising. People start using electricity about nine o'clock, maybe going to shower or cooking an egg, I don't know. But we see that, that the battery is, uh, is used to, uh, to, 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 to feed into the house. Then we see the solar energy is charging the solar unit, the, the, the storage unit until it's full. And at the end of the day, the electricity is used during the evening. This means also that when the sun is starting to shine, the battery will start charging. And this is the issue for the grid. We see the green line, maximum grid capacity, and we see four houses with solar energy. And we see that the demand of energy produced is more than the grid can handle. So we place the battery that you can see on the right side of the slide but it starts charging at the beginning of the day. So we start charging and at the moment that we have the issue on the grid, all batteries are full, so they can't help us. Well, with the user process, we uh, made a schedule for the batteries based on a prognosis and be sure that the batteries in house one will charge first, then house two, then three, and then four. And we see the effect is that at the end of the day, the, 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 the energy flow is within its limits. 
Well, that's what we did in the, the pre-pilot. And we introduced the USEF uh, process, having five phases contract, making the first agreement, the plan phase, how many energy will be over the grid, the validation phase, the phase where the DSO stayed in, in this case, uh, evaluates and sees if the energy flow can uh, be handled by the grid, the realization phase and the settlement. I will show you the plan, validate and realization phase in uh, in the pre-pilot. This is one day that we measured in the pre-pilot and the day ahead we saw a prognosis uh, where we can see that the uh, there is a risk on congestion because the predicted flow is bigger than the maximum capacity indicated by the orange line in the picture. So this means that the orange uh, part in top is a request for flexibility that we did to the aggregator. The aggregator brings us an offer, it says, all right, we can uh, use the storage units at that moment in time to be used to, uh, to, to, to lower the feed in into the grid because it's a possible congestion by solar energy. All right, we said as stated, in, we accept this flex offer because when we use this flex offer to make a new prediction of the flow in the net, we see the purple prediction and we see that it's really within the borders of the, 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 the electricity grid at the local area. And that's what happened at the day itself, the day afterwards, when the program was uh, was done and the batteries were, were uh, used as uh, as uh, predicted. We see in yellow the actual profile on the day, and we see that at the end of the day, the predicted grid pain is mitigated by flexibility from storage. This is what we did in the pre-pilot, and this is how flexibility is done by the, the use of process and uh, can really relieve pain. But of course, this was a very quite small pilot and uh, we want to do more pilots uh, to, to, to get more used and more confident in that, if, in fact, in this, this mechanism, if this will work. So also in the Irish project, and then I come to some conclusions and next steps. In the Irish project, we uh, can uh, use the fact that the pre-pilot results as presented showed that flexibility using the use of market control mechanism can relieve congestion pain. We've seen in the whole Dalen project that I show, but also in other uh, pre-pilot we did in, uh, in Utrecht, in <coughs> Lombok, uh, with electric charging that we can really steer the flow in the grid. And this lessons learned will, as I said, uh, be used, including use of framework in the Irish project in the Utrecht demonstration area, where we will combine more, where we will combine batteries, we will combine solar energy, and we will combine the smart solar charging to see how we can uh, how we can handle uh, the energy flows in the energy grid. And with this conclusion and next steps, I want to thank you for uh, your attention for my presentation. And uh, I will hear if there are some questions in the chat box. And if you want to ask me myself questions directly, my email address is on the bottom of the slide, john.hodemakers at stadin.net. Thank you for your attention, and I'll give the word to uh, Rob. Um, thank you, uh, John, for your presentation. Um, we will now switch back uh, to the presentation, the final presentation of this webinar uh, from Christian Keim. Um, yeah, Christian will tell us something about the self-consumption uh, approach that is being developed right now. Christian, yes. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, well, just shortly make uh, the move from uh, the individual to the common self-consumption, which actually what it would be meant in France, what uh, John just presented. So, next slide, please. Um, so, the question is, uh, you have your house, uh, you have your PV installation, you think you can consume it uh, by yourself. But, well, uh, next, please. What you will have to understand is that actually why, even though it's not really a good business, why should I just be free to auto-produce or auto-consume or whatever with my uh, own system? Next, please. So let's take the example we have seen before. If we just take 20 million people, we say 10 kilowatt hour for each and every 200 gigawatt hours. And if you see across the rear of the impact will not be huge. We might have just about 80. We know how do we have to handle uh, 80 power plant operators and their participating markets regulated. We know how to deal with them. But what we do with 8 million people 
which you can't control actually. It might have a big impact after your chest tube operation to join on the grid. So next please. Um, so what happens in France is that actually all this was not possible two years ago. So uh, you had not that such freedom in any way. So you just to fit in all the, the, the power you had, except you were on a remote island or in a self-sufficient, uh, let's say, part of the grid. So um, next please. So since two years, with any traditional law, everybody can have its own installation and self-consume. However, the guiding principle here is the smaller the better. Why? Well, if you have an installation which is less than uh, 100 kilowatt per peak, actually you get some invest, some um, you get some help for the investment into the system. Uh, you have a fixed price, a kind of a feed-in tariff for your excess energy that you produce and not how to consume, and actually not using the public grid, so you pay not the grid taxes. Next, please. If you jump from the 100 kilowatt per peak to a higher, to a bigger one, you're forced to go, well, you have already no uh, help for investment, and actually you have to sell the surplus energy prices through coal for tenders, which are regulated by the regulator. So actually what the market, this type of uh, regulation, what it forces you is on one side, it's pushing that you have smart home and buildings that you put up storage as selling the energy is not good as self what they are pushing the people is actually the consume as much as possible next please after now we go from that is what is the individual self-consumption or let's go into common sense of consumption so it might be a pv on top of a building um, a housing block with many tenants or might be one building which has a lot of PV and just building uh, on the side we could consume the energy. Next, please. Actually, what this really a legal building, this really a legal issue. So, actually, who owns the PV plant? It's not that one it consumes it, or more people, or people that consume it actually not owning the plant. And they're not sharing the same meter. There will be probably one meter for each and everybody. And actually, they are using still the distribution grid, the public distribution grid. So this is a kind of a legal issue to dealt with. Next, please. Technically speaking, the rules are pretty simple. I'll try to explain it to you. So we have um, the, uh, the primary substation, we go into the medium level, then we have the secondary substation, we go to the low voltage level. Next, please. And there is a parallel has to happen behind a secondary substation. There is one moral person, or legal person, who's representing the whole action. If you say in action, Sorry, it's come from the French part. Actually, it's the organization of all the consumers, but not only them, also the PV operator, the PV for the maintenance, any business that might be in the building or whoever participated in the financing. Next, please. Behind this the secondary substation level, you cannot do whatever you want. You are constrained to a 100 kilowatt peak installation. It should be less. You cannot put more. Moreover, you have to ensure that you have at least 50% of the energy is self-consumed. So what you can have, next please, you can have the following picture. Station, plants, which define the perimeter for the moral person. We don't have to be the same, so they have to parties can participate independently in these two moral persons. They should be somehow defined that different. And then next please, you have one thing in mind physically directly interconnected it might be just a legal parameters so you can have pick people from two buildings and distribute them among these two installations to make let's say uh, the best way to self-consume this energy next please however this is not possible that even though you share the same wall if two neighbors are not behind the same secondary system they can be connected they cannot belong to the same or person that's not possible so Really, the issue here is they have to be physically connected as a second substation. So once you have all this clear, what next? What happens is actually have to identify how you then re redistribute this energy because although the PV produce some part, it will be redistributed by, uh, let's say, by square meter or by share investment or by, let's say, blockchain, real time monetary, whatever. So this PV has to be redistributed between the different consumers. And these keys for distribution are given back to the distribution system operator who makes then the calculation between what you have 
uh, what was the part on the share of PV that belongs to you, and so what is the delta in, uh, in your energy that you globally consume that has to be repaid off to whoever is the retailer. So next please. And then if you have anything that you didn't consume, it will be actually go for free to the grid by default, so no feed-in tariff, or you have to go through market tender and then to see what tariff you might get. Next, please. So um, the business model is not easy because actually network taxes about just 12% of savings on the part of the grid taxes. So the return of investment is pretty low. You, have, you get to a tariff which is somewhere gravitating between a peak hour and the off peak hour price um, and in any case what is really the big issue except any financial issue is that actually all the rules that have to govern this global consensus is it's uh, it's not clarified yet and yet it's a big risk for whoever uh, for the green as brownfield projects or new project or restoration project next please um, the legal issue on the bed is actually can somebody which is not somebody of the tournament, just anybody, any third party, be the investor of the PV plant or the to it? So, uh, what are the legal constraints to apply? Is it even legally possible? So, there are many models that have to be searched and explored. Then, if you're, for example, a social option to put a PV on the top, but how do you re redistribute the capital expenses and the oper operation expenses between the renting or the selling price, or how do you distribute then the operational expenses among the common charges, what can you do, how it influence? And then in any case, if you're talking about a housing cooperative, a multifamily block, a business park, a technology park, what if the new owners might opt out out of five years, all have changed, they don't want to stay in this uh, contract, they don't care about this uh, the V system and the self-consumption, what, what is possible, who takes the risk about all that? So, uh, well, last one, please. So the, the big, much the technical issues, it's really these contractual issues, which actually defining a business model. And, in France, at least, we really have to clarify all these aspects to be able to make this thing happening, uh, make possible that a common community of people can self-consume, self-produce energy on site. Thank you very much.